Welcome to the Bedrock Way Podcast, where we're changing the habits of yesterday by creating the new healthcare reality of tomorrow. And today, Jonathan, we have a very, very special guest, and I feel like a broken record, guys, because I say it all the time. I love what the podcast has become. This is our first recording in 2024, a year that we hope to be so epic in the way that we see the podcast matriculate. We did about 21 episodes, 22 episodes in 2023, where we stuck to our mission, which was to elevate and pro- proclaim the voice of healthcare and give healthcare, you know, the, the platform that it had lacked through the pandemic. And I think an industry that has lacked a voice, an industry that needs to really come out front and center is senior housing, assisted living, independent living, that in from 2020, 2021, 22, and 23 has just faced a tremendous laborious path of recovering from the pandemic. Senior living was affected more probably than any other industry or as much as any other industry. And my guest today, Mr. Dan Wolin, the Senior Vice President of Operations for Distinctive Senior Living, was the perfect guest for me to really start opening up the lines of communication, the public relations lines of communication, as it pertains to the evolution of senior living. Senior living is an industry that is very close to my heart. I started my career uh, practically in senior living, but my first ever patient that I saw in home care was in a senior living community in Manahawkin, New Jersey. The patient's name was Connie White, and I will never forget Connie White. Connie White taught me so much about senior living. Connie White was 92 years old. I went to see her with shoulder pain in a community in Manahawkin, New Jersey, in the memory care uh, side of uh, the community, and it changed my career forever. The trajectory of my career changed forever because I fell in love with senior living, and I never knew that seniors would spend so much money to go into these, what I called older adult dorms, right? Older adult college dorms. And were the benefactors of such great care by such great people. So I fell in love with the industry. So it's a great cycle today to have Dan Wolling on the show, a seasoned professional who I known the better part of the last two decades, who knows senior living, who knows practically the evolution of it, but most importantly, where it's going. Dan has seen the best, the worst, and is probably thinking that we still have the best ahead of us. So Dan, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the Bedrock Way podcast. Thank you, Andre. Happy New Year to you. And Happy New Year to you. So today's podcast title, Beyond the Four Walls of Senior Living, Beyond the Four Walls, Rethinking the Future of Senior Living. Dan Wolin, for my listeners, is a highly accomplished healthcare executive specializing in translating sound business strategies into maximum profits commensurate with the best interests of a company, shareholders, customers, employees, and the public. His expertise is in assisted living regulations and has a proven track record of sound fiscal success. Dan Wolin is dedicated to maintaining a reputation built on high standards, customer excellence, and dedication to senior living. Core competencies include merger acquisition specialist, employee development, business partner relationships, succession planning, business development, market expansion, growth strategies, and an analytical analysis. Analytical analysis. Oh, those, those NOI and those P&Ls and those income statements, right? Fun, fun, fun. Currently, Dan is the Senior Vice President of Operations for Distinctive Senior Living. He leads and directs the organization to operational excellence and financial success through strategic initiatives. He oversees asset management, capital planning, resident care, and quality assurance, culinary, and regional operations. That's a pretty, that's a pretty uh, intense position there, Mr. Dan. That's a lot. That's a lot. Thank you. <laughs> so let's start off. Let's start off easy, Dan. Let's start off with how you grew up in the industry, which can include how you grew up in general, and how you came to be Dan, who it is now. When I met you, you were the executive director of a community in Marlboro, New Jersey. 
And I've seen you metamorphosize into this executive who, again, is 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 meddling with with big real estate companies and really becoming a change agent of the industry. And I love that. I love that such humble beginnings has matriculated you to be in this imposing, influential role. So tell us about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Andre. So I've actually been in senior living for the better part of 25 years. My, my first job was actually an activity assistant at a local regional-based assisted living. Um, I, when I got into it, I had no idea what I was doing. I walked in, applied for the job, said, I'll, I'll do whatever you need me to do. And they looked at me and they said, huh, we need somebody to call bingo after dinner for our residents. And Okay, <laughs> I could do that. I could do that. And um, next thing you know, I was working all the holidays and the weekends, basically the shifts nobody else wanted to work, uh, doing anything from bingo to hangman, word games. I, like you, Andre, I fell in love with it. Right off the bat, I fell in love with it. I realized quickly our residents are living, breathing, walking encyclopedias. Um, I wanted to be with our residents as much as I wanted to be with my own family and, and, and with my friends. And um, when there was no more hours in the activity department, I asked for more hours in the dining department and I washed dishes. I served in the dining room and it was an industry I just fell in love with automatically. And I knew I wanted to do more. Uh, I loved these residents. I loved the experiences that they shared, their life experiences to the point that to this day, I still can remember those residents by, to your, to your story, by name, by face. I can remember the things that they, that they taught me. And I, I hope to take that forever for the rest of my career. After working there, I decided I wanted to get into management and leadership. I, I, I could tell that, that this was an industry that I wanted to dedicate my career to. And um, I, I joined on with a senior living uh, competitor uh, doing uh, as a memory care director, uh, working with residents with cognitive impairment. And I uh, was very fortunate. I've had some really great mentors over, over the course of my career. Uh, who took me under their wing. I, I learned a lot of great practices that I wanted to continue in my career. And um, I was given the opportunity to go into that company's executive director and training program where I became an executive director and right around the same time that I met you. And just, I knew that there was more. I knew that there was more that I could give to the industry, but I also more so knew that the industry could could give back to, to myself. And um, and here I am today. I'm, I'm privileged to be able to uh, travel to different communities, different areas of the country, and um, be able to offer my 25 years of experience. But the great part is, is I continue to learn every single day. And and I learned that from our executive directors, from our, our on-site team, all the way down to that activity assistant that that was me 25 years ago, so. Let me, let me ask you something, because I think someone with your experience, I think for the listeners, you know, the, pandemic was very, very, very um, traumatic, for lack of a better word. How did you guys, how did you use your 20 plus years almost experience at that point in time to make sure you rallied people, you know, during those days? Because again, I know not only the residents, but really the staff, it, it was very traumatic for the staff. How, how has that pandemic changed you, Dan? Mm -hmm. You know, we were in uncharted waters. We didn't know. There was a lot of things as industry um, executives and that we talked about of, of how the industry needed to change. We were forced to. We were thrust into it. We, you know, March of 2020, we didn't have a choice. Uh, a lot of our communities, I, I wasn't with Distinctive at the time. I was with another senior living provider. Um, our, our doors were closed. We, we, we couldn't bring a lot of the outside world in. And, and we had to lean on, on technology. We had to learn on technology to to keep the business going uh but f to be honest looking back on it almost four years later we didn't know what we didn't know and we did it together and i think as an industry it wasn't just each individual company in a silo we as an industry came together and we shared best practices we were all in the same boat together the pandemic brought us together because the pandemic taught us the competition is for the bottom feeders and competition is for people who are short-sighted. Because I agree with you, we needed each other during the pandemic. That collaborative approach, we would have never got gotten through the pandemic if we did not rely on people to get us tests and goggles and gowns and be there for us at a time where it seemed everybody wanted to run away from senior living. Absolutely, absolutely. We we were all in it together. There, there it, We weren't competitors back then. We were all in the same boat. We were all struggling to keep our, our residents safe, uh, keep our team members safe, 
and just continue one day at a time. So yeah, there was no competition back then. It was, we we're all in the same boat. We're all paddling in the same direction. And I do think that in 2024, we're going to see that pandemic recovery end. You know, we're already seeing, Dan, that the census has, in many regions in the country, has reached pre-pandemic levels. And we have that amazing momentum of census right now towards the end of 2023 that will carry into 2024 and to 2025. We'll talk about the baby boomer retirement and the aging of the silver tsunami, how that's going to affect uh, senior living. But I wanted to start off with the recalibration, rebalancing of senior housing and the fact that we're seeing finally, finally, that shift from IL to AL. So finally in 2024, the, the experts are prognosticating that we're going to see more assisted livings than we see independent livings, right? And the prevalent offering will be assisted living, which goes hand in hand with the resident acuity. Absolutely. I mean, as the acuity goes up, we're seeing more in our assisted livings. Um, we're seeing independent living is, is still, it still has a place at the table. It really does. But what you're also starting to see is, is an uptick of, of active adults. And, and, and we, we, we're doing a lot of active adult developments. Um, but yeah, independent living is, is certainly out there. It's something that, that's important, but we're starting to see the transition. You know, if you looked pre-pandemic, residents didn't want to go from independent living to assisted living. Now they're making that transition because they're seeing that the offers, offerings and the services that we have in our assisted livings are right on par with what we're doing in independent living. So why not be able to age in that, that same location and, and not have to worry about transitioning down the line? But I think what the, the silver tsunami is going to do, so we have the oldest baby boomer turning 80 in 2025. We have the move from IL to AL becoming the most prevalent offering. And then with the acknowledged resident acuity skyrocketing in senior living, we're going to expect to see more of what we call a high acuity value-based care play in senior living. But operators like Distinctive Senior Living are going to have to look at their staff, but not the staff that they think they should look at, their vendor staff, right? Their care staff, their physicians, their therapists, their pharmacists, their dietitians. Are they aligned with a vendor staff, with partners who are going to embrace and engage in that value care play? So how are you guys looking at your vendors? Because if I'm a senior living operator right now, and I know that I have to prepare for, to basically end that post-pandemic recovery, it's over. I have a more acute patient every day. I have a silver tsunami and the baby boomers coming who are looking for a different approach, but I have the same partners that I've always had. So what is Distinctive Senior Living doing right now to make sure that you guys become not a participant in the high acuity value-based care play, but a front runner, a pioneer that leads from the front? Well, and I think what you said was very important. It's a partnership. You know, when you and I met each other 20 some years ago, the relationship that we had was we're going to rent you a space and you're going to give me X hundred dollars a month to, to rent a, a, an apartment or to rent a, a common area space to set up shop, right? Everybody's doing that these days. So what partnerships do we have so that it's mutually agreeable to both sides? Because the, the pre-pandemic and back when you and I first met each other, it, it seemed like a very one-sided relationship. It was, you come in, you give me, you know, rent to, to rent space and you just kind of run your own show. Well, that doesn't work. It's all about collaboration and partnership. And that's really what we're all looking for right now coming out of the pandemic. We want to have those partners. We don't want to have that one-sided relationship. We want it to be a partnership where we know that we're getting as much out of that relationship as you're getting out of us. And and that's it's it's the way it's going to be moving forward for both parties to be successful. A partnership is just like a marriage, right? Any any type of relationship with a romantic, platonic, personal, professional there has to be an exchange of value. And there has to be an exchange where if my industry has changed, 
if my industry is demanding more from me, then I rely on my partners to also elevate their game. Just like your spouse. spouse. If the going gets tough for Dan, your spouse is gonna be there to support you. If the going gets tough for distinctive senior living, your partners have to be there to support you. So one thing that that we're seeing, and and I saw a recent article, Dan, and it was the uh, representative, the CEO from Arrow Senior Living, Stephanie Harris, and she said something that was so profound, and I wanted to get your take on it. And she basically said that catering to baby boomers will require changing the industry's long-held paradigms. So think about this. We just discussed how our partners, our vendors need to evolve. They need to change. But quite frankly, we also need to look in the mirror ourselves as an industry and change ourselves. And here's what Stephanie said. The industry has historically done a lot of telling people when they can eat and what they can do. And we're realizing that doesn't work for today's consumer. She said during a panel discussion at this year's NIC conference, so just a few months ago. She's also in favor of a more dynamic pricing structure that is flexible to many different economic situations. But let's go back to the first point where she talks about the rigidity of our industry, which again, provides that cookie cutter approach, looks at every resident the same, paints them all with the same brush, right? You need to have a very specific look at your future demographic that is changing. The boomer is not gonna be the post-depression traditionalist. The boomer is gonna demand a lot more. So how is distinctive and how should the industry, Dan, get ready for that? And is Stephanie correct? She's absolutely correct because we can't look at our seniors any different than we look at each other and ourselves, right? This summer, my family and I are gonna go on a cruise. And I've gone on cruises over the course of when I was a child and you know, growing up. And I remember my first cruise, it was um, dinner was at five and at eight. Now, my family didn't eat at five or at eight at home, but we would go on a cruise, but we had to choose from that. Well, what has happened now? You go on a cruise, if we're going on a cruise right now, it's open seating. The dining room is open. You go when you want. If you want to go at five, you go at five. If you want to go at 5.30, you go at 5.30. Why should our seniors be any different? And, and, and she is right. She's right. Back in the day when I got into the industry, you got into the industry 25, 30 years ago, we had the depression era. Those residents were happy to just have a meal. I remember my grandfather, my, when I would go to my grandparents' house, my grandmother would say, John, what do you want for lunch? And he'd say, well, what do you got? I'll have whatever. Well, that's different. Now, if I'm at home and my wife says to me, what do you want for lunch? Uh, I'd like a roast beef sandwich. When we go shopping, let's get roast beef. It's, there, there's a level of you get what you, you want and you desire and you make your needs known. And, and we have to do the same thing. We can't expect that our residents are going to fall into a certain category. We've got to be prepared. We've got to be prepared. And this is a lot of that hospitality model. <clears throat> We've got to be prepared to meet their needs, what their requests are. And and yes, as an industry, it makes it more difficult for us because we have to account for the needs and the desires and the wishes of several of our residents. But but that's the hospitality model. And, and that's what we should be doing. But this is something that has always really, has never made sense to me, Dan. So listen to what we just talked about. We talked about from one of the industry leaders that says that the the boomers, the baby boomers, are going to challenge the industry's long-held paradigms, right, where we tell them what to do, when to do it. Perfect example with the crews. But yet, when you talk to some senior living operators and some experienced nurses, executive directors, salespeople, they, they will always say, it's residence choice. Has it? been resident choice or is that just a statement that we like to say to sometimes be even more rigid in the way that we operate that's a great question and the answer my answer is that's a statement that we've grown up saying in the industry it's residents choice but then when you stop and you say how so there's a real difficulty to answer the question because it hasn't been residents choice if we say well it's easier for our team members 
when they come in to get that resident up at 6.30. Well, Andre, what time do you normally get up? Do you get up at 6.30? No, I don't get up at 6.30. Well, you're going to get up at 6.30. It's your choice. Well, what exactly does that mean? Well, it means you get up at 6.30 when our staff is available or you wait until they have extra time. That's not resident choice. That's falling in line with what's convenient for our teams. I think that the statement resident's choice has been a smokescreen. Smokescreen. It honestly has precluded operators from advancing their missions. Because you're right, it hasn't been. It hasn't been resident choice. So let's take the second half of the statement where she talks about the need for more dynamic pricing structure that is flexible to many different economic situations. So we have communities that are, are only Medicaid. We have communities that you know range into the five digits of monthly rent. We have communities that you can they need a pre buy in to go into the community, and we have communities that um, are have a mixture of the two. Right? How is distinctive senior living, and how should the industry, Dan, start planning ahead? for those economic pricing structures that the boomers are going to demand? It's, it's knowing your product, right? As, as a senior living operator, we've often, as an executive director, I, I'd have a prospect come in and they'd said, well, so-and-so down the street is doing this. They're giving this for free. They're giving third month free. They're t taking 10% off. Well, is that an apples to apple product? It's not. It's not. We have to know what we are. And, and we've long stand talked about a SWOT analysis, right? Our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities, and our threats. For me, it's about knowing our competitors and knowing what are they better than us at? What are they not? And leveraging our strengths to be able to say that. I remember I was, I was the executive director at a community one time, and I, I, an adult son came in. I remember this. This was 15 years ago. And he came in, and he said that one of our competitors you know, was 20% was cheaper. And I said, but do you realize that... This is what they're offering and this is what we're offering. You know, they they didn't have, we talked about dining program. Their dining program was subpar to ours, right? But they had an amazing resident experience. Well, guess what? Mom was coming from a from her home situation where nutrition was a big challenge. She was a social butterfly. So did she need the glitz and the glamour of the no, she needed our dining experience. She needed our nutrition program. So there was a value. You know, we talk about value-based care. I'm a firm believer, our prospects and our residents will pay where they see value. If they don't see value, you could sell it for $500 a month. They won't cope because they don't see the value. But if they see a value in what you're offering, they will pay what our market rate is. It's no different than vehicles. I mean, I, I hate to draw senior living to vehicles, but there are individuals who see the value of a $100,000 car, right? They, they pay for that. They could find a Ford for a fraction of the price, but they see the value of the the higher end product it's the same with our industry we have to know the markets that we're in we have to know our competitors but more so and you referenced this earlier we have to look in the mirror and know what our product is and once we know who we are and we're comfortable with that we can sell that all day long and this is something dan that the experts are really pushing for 2024 and not pushing in a way to endorse it but pushing in a way to have executives like yourselves be aware, and that's concession wars. The wars of concession pricing are coming back. And those wars are when, like you said, people will undercut each other, not so much for value, but for just pricing. And I've always been a believer that in the presence of value, pricing becomes irrelevant. That's something that, again, has never made sense to me in senior living. We, we will build a community for millions of dollars and then we will undercut the price and then just sell price and not sell value. We have, as an industry, I believe, put an overemphasis on an occupancy number. I want to get to 100%. I want to get to 95%. But at what cost? It, to me, it's not about the occupancy as much as the revenue that it generates, right? So you could be at 90% getting full rate or you could be at 100% Get a, taking 30% off, guess what? The revenue of that 90% is going to outweigh long-term the concession. Because we also have to remember, it's it's not in a silo. As much as we don't want to admit it, residents 
families, they talk, right? Go to such and such community, they're giving 30% off. So it, it has a trickle down effect that really becomes reputational. It becomes a reputation. That, that's the low ball product. And, and we don't want to have low ball products. We shouldn't want that. We should want to have a product where we can get good occupancy, strong rate, strong revenue, because then in turn, we can put that back into our communities. And we're seeing that a lot coming out of the pandemic. We're seeing a lot of, of, of private equity, REITs looking to make changes in the management company, right? Why are they doing that? Because they have lost sight as to who they are. And you have to have an identity. You have to know who your identity is. We're not always going to be the, the A plus asset, but we don't want to be the D asset. We want to be that B plus A minus asset. And, and, and it's really knowing who you are and knowing who your competitors are. I agree. I think that we, we're seeing a paradigm shift also in the, in the real estate inver- investment trust, the REITs. Um, the investors like Well Tower, they're looking to realign themselves and, and have more regional presence. So they can have the economy of scale power to manage the scalability of these endeavors, right? Investments which are very, very pricey. But you mentioned something that just sparked my my um, my mind in the fact of luxury senior living, right? And value goes in line with luxury. Let's be honest. The more valuable something is, the more luxurious it is. But it doesn't have to be. But now in real estate, it, it is, right? So we're seeing that luxury senior living levels are up as operators are looking to accommodate, you know, those seniors that have a taste for the finer things in life. At the same Nick conference, there was a comment made by one of the attendants. This particular um, attendee at the Nick conference said, and this was related to luxury senior living going up. Where the product type was once defined by crystal chandeliers and fine dining, luxury senior living is now all about a feeling. In 2023 and going into 2024, it's becoming less uncommon to see communities with monthly rates in the five digits and offering world-class concierge services rivaling the country's top hotels. And then when they talk about residents, prospective residents, one and a feeling, they talk about what the young kids talk about, right? A vibe. You want to feel the environment. Could care less about a fancy, you know, chandelier carpet or if they serve steak and shrimp. I want to feel good. Because if I feel good, I look good, and everything else stems from there. What do you think st- distinctive should do as you guys move forward and the industry as we tend to cater to a more sophisticated, luxury-desiring resident. I agree with that. It's it's not about the chandelier. It's not about the granite countertops. It's not about any of that. When, when prospects choose that luxury feel, it's not because of the actual physical product. It's the thought and the attention that, they've, that that community and that management company or owner has put into that product. And, and I agree. I mean, I... I, we have a community um, in right outside of uh, in Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania, and their pub is tremendous. I remember when I got in the industry, you know, happy hour was every Wednesday. They wheel out a cart with some O'Douls and some cheap wine, and that was happy hour. Now our residents can go in and they can get a variety of beers and wines. They can get a mixed drink. That's that's the vibe. That's that that is that vibe. And and when you live somewhere or you're on vacation. You want to feel comfortable. You want to feel like you're in your element and like you're being appreciated. So yeah, I agree. I don't think it's, I don't think that prospect or that resident says, oh, there's that crystal chandelier. I feel at home. What they're really saying is, is I appreciate and I feel the vibe to your point that that operator has put into their community. It's not the physical product. It's the thought behind it. And you also have the vibe then when you're a partner, right? When you provide ancillary services to senior living communities, you get that vibe when you walk in. And that vibe usually is the ambiance, but also the culture, right? Also the staff. You have to invest in the vibe of the staff because let's be honest, you know, we have a meeting with our salesperson. We talk to the executive director, the, the nurse, the DON does an assessment, and then we rarely see those guys, right? We usually are seeing the frontline staff, which encompasses 
you know, your maintenance housekeeping team, your caregiving team, your dietary team, right? That That's who you're seeing the okay. most often. So what are we doing to make sure that the vibe that is being deployed by that frontline team is consistent and commensurate with the vibe of the entire ambience that that top leadership gives that resident when they first walk into the community? So first off is them knowing our expectations as an organization. What are our expectations? And, th and that's set forth right off the bat in the interview process, orientation, onboarding, but also letting them know they're the most important person in that community. Now, that's the age old question in our industry. Who's the most important person? Is it the resident or the team members? We believe it's our team members because if our team members aren't checked in and we don't have the best of the best providing that care and those services, our residents aren't gonna be happy. Very rarely, if ever, have we ever done a, a resident engagement survey, whether it be an annual thing or just you know ad hoc, where a resident or a family member comes back and says, yeah, I just don't like the cabinetry in my mom's apartment. It, it talks about the nurse. It talks about the caregiver. It talks about the dining staff. It talks about how attentive the staff is. That's who's most important in our industry is the caregivers and, and, and the housekeepers. It, it's everybody. And, and, you know, I have a special appreciation of that. I shared it earlier. That's where I started. So I recognize that. It, it's, you know, I, I've often said if the executive director of our community takes a week-long vacation, the community still runs. If the caregivers don't come in, if the housekeepers don't come in, if the dining staff doesn't come in, we're in trouble. We need them more than they need us. And, and, and that's really where we're in right now when we talk about pandemic. We lost a lot of really good um, team members in our industry during the pandemic. And, and how are we backfilling that now? How are we bringing up the next generation of senior living providers and, and leaders? That statement lends itself to be an inquiry. What are we doing? You know, you, you mentioned earlier the hospitality approach, which I agree a thousand percent. I think we need to look at senior living and healthcare in general as a hospitality mentality rather than a care mentality because, you know, we're dealing with a, uh, and again, we live in a world last week, Dan, I wanted food. I went on my app. Uber Eats, and I had food in my house 20 minutes later. If I want to go somewhere, I have an app, and then the cars that are pick me up five minutes later. Anything that we want is very concierge in nature, you know, and as we get older, it's that, that demand only increases. So what are we doing, again, to maintain that level of concierge with our future resident? Right. So I think that's one side of the coin. And then the other side of the coin is making sure that the staff who, again, delivers that concierge approach is your staff, not agency staff, because that agency staff doesn't have, you know, the appreciation for your culture. They don't have the appreciation for catering to these residents and they don't know what the resident is paying. Right. And what value they expect for that investment, you know, staffing. Human capital remains, as you mentioned, our number one issue because without the frontline teams, we're nothing. Senior living won't survive. So what are we doing, again, to maintain that future pipeline of staff in senior living? I think this is a really good topic of conversation for us right now because it's it's we're going to go into a lot of the public relation issues that senior living has faced and will face. But I always say that your best public relation contingency is a strong culture. I mentioned it a couple minutes ago, knowing our expectations, but also knowing the end result and not just the because it, it's in our policies and procedures, like the, the benefit that comes from what they do. And, and oftentimes we'll lose team members because they'll say, oh, so-and-so down the street's offering five cents an hour more. Nobody is leaving for five cents an hour. That might be the icing on the cake for them, but they're leaving because they don't feel either A, the culture of the organization, or they don't feel like they have a personal connection. I remember I worked for a company who used to do uh, the, the Gallup Q12 survey. And one of the things was, is I feel like my job is important. And how many of our team members really feel like their job is important? And are we explaining to them why it's important and the benefit that happens from it? it you know, it, it's no different than we do with our own children, right? When you tell your kids, do it because I said so, they're not going to do it. But when you explain the why behind it, 
And that's really what it is. What is our why? You hear this all the time in interviews. We may even say it in our interviews for prospective employees. What is your why? Well, let's explain the why. The why behind why I need you to do that. The why behind we have this policy and procedure. You'll be amazed at the buy-in and the engagement that we get from our team members when they understand why they're doing it and not just because we told them so. And you need to have that level of appreciation and that level of of understanding and quite frankly, that level of of almost confidence because we're dealing with a population where memory care has become, you know, highly, highly prevalent. And I know Distinctive Senior Living has some freestanding uh, memory care communities. Do they? We do. We have- so you guys have freestanding memory care communities. So I would assume then that it's even more important, more imperative, and more challenging to have consistency with staffing in memory care communities, or is it? Uh, it? It's absolutely important. It's absolutely important because a lot of our memory support residents thrive on that consistency and that same face. That resident may not know that person's name, but they know that that's a safe face and that's a safe person. So you talked before about agency, why we don't want to have agency. We want that consistency. We want that resident to feel good at the end of the day and feel like they're safe. If they don't feel safe, that's when we start to see challenges arise. So yeah, it's all about that consistency and giving that level of of comfort. And that's not just for memory support. That's for assisted living and even independent living as as well. We we all know those. We talked about you know going to a restaurant. You go to that restaurant. You have that restaurant around the corner. You know that that hostess. You know that same server. You feel good. You know you're going to have a good experience because you've had one before. You may not remember an exact detail behind it. You may not remember the exact meal you got at that restaurant, but you know you had a good experience. And and it keeps you coming back for more. As we talk about staffing, and I think something that is very interesting and intriguing, and I think something that we should talk about, Dan, is our seniors, our grandparents, our grandmothers have that have had that longstanding education for the future generation, right? For their grandkids, they've be, they've become, like you said, those walking encyclopedias. And as we see more of the future or the previous generation, like boomers moving into senior living, you're seeing those that education become very orphaned, right? Because those grandkids are not getting those walking encyclopedias because they're having their grandparents move into senior living. So one thing that we have to be conscious of that is that that grandkid who is not getting that that maternal paternal education from their grandparents is now working in senior living. So a way for them to get a, that education, that generational um, you know, insight is by working and interacting with seniors. I know personally, and I know you feel the same way. I've learned so much from our seniors in our communities. And I think if there's a way for us to promote the the employment in our senior living communities as something that's more attractive and positive, rather than focusing all these negative stories that, that quite frankly put a very misinformed stigma on working in senior living. You said it, we talked about it earlier. This is an industry where if our team members need to take away from their jobs as much as our residents take away from what our, our, our team members bring to them. And we need to give them the opportunity to thrive. And we need to give our team members the opportunity to really sit down and spend quality time, not just be task focused. We need to give them the opportunity to have a conversation and learn about them. And, and, and a lot of that we're seeing now with a lot of the technological platforms that we're using where we get a, we, we used to call it a demographic profile in a resident knowing their career, knowing what they did for hobbies and interests and friends and and connecting that. And and when I look back on my 25 years in the industry, some of the residents that made the biggest impact on me back in 1999, 2000, 2001, I, I learned those things just by sitting down and having a conversation. And oh, by the way, that's a great, we talk about activity, it's a great activity. Oh, that, 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 that's, so, that's, so, that's awesome. But let's focus on changing gears into the not so positive. And so recently, the Washington Post ran a series of articles that were picked up by other news medias where it really gave a black eye to senior living. 
and I'm sure everyone can look for the articles, but I will just focus on a couple of topics that the article brought to light. And, you know, I think then you, as much as anyone, myself included, can appreciate sometimes the constructive things that we go through. But it's it's sad that these are the things that get microscoped. There's so many good things. There's so many good things, experiences um, that can be platform and sensationalized. But unfortunately, that's not what the press is all about. So this um, Washington Post series was called Dying Broke. And it focused a lot on, again, the, the sensationalism of senior living being a very for-profit business with very little care about its demographic, which, quite frankly, I think it could be, it could, nothing could be further from the truth. However, it gave many, many examples of elopement, issues with staffing, and most importantly, it also talked about the fact that some communities really failed, failed their residents during the COVID pandemic. But one of the things that the article talked about was the fact that we need as an industry to be less focused on profits and more focused on care outcomes. And as one particular person in the article said, care should prioritize the real estate not the real estate prioritizing care or real estate over care, care over real estate, which is the preference. What do you think about that article? I know you had an opportunity to, to review it, but I, I want this also to be a set the record straight uh, type of thing, Dan, because again, I'm as a staunch supporter or promoter of senior living as, as it comes. And while I don't think our industry is perfect. No industry is perfect. I do think that it's being unfairly targeted. What do you think about that article? What do you think about you know those comments? And are they things that we should be concerned with? I think anytime an article like this comes out, we need to pause and look in the mirror. Um, you're right. No industry is perfect. And, and if we really want to put the time and the effort into it, we can write a whole article about any industry. We could talk about doctors, we could talk about lawyers, we could talk about law enforcement. If you look hard enough, you can find something. And and are there some really unfortunate outcomes in that article? Absolutely. Are there providers and individuals that needed that wake up call? Absolutely. But to to target the entire industry, I think was 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 unfortunate. It was unfortunate because the senior living industry, and we talked about it earlier, is just coming out of the pandemic, and, and we're finally clearing up the black eye of the pandemic. And in the article, it talks about the pandemic. And there was no playbook for what we went through in 2020. Um, we talked about earlier how all providers were getting together, sharing best practices, because we were all in that same boat together. We tried as an industry as hard as we could to come together and to care for our residents and care for our team members. The unfortunate fact is, is that just as quickly as we were hiring team members, we were also losing them. So it wasn't for lack of profits. I, I've worked for a number of senior living organizations, as I know you have as well, Andre. Uh, we've, we've never compromised our care in any of those organizations for the sake of a dollar, right? Um, a lot of times when we have residents that are have been with us for five, 10 years, they've exhausted their funds. They they ask for, you know, what could we do about concessions? I'll tell you the one thing that we never do is we never compromise the care, right? If a resident requires a care level four, we're gonna charge that resident a care level four. So it's interesting they talked about the real estate and the care because we, we as an industry typically do not negotiate care because we know what, what that in turn brings. So yeah, I think it's unfortunate. It's an unfortunate outcome. Yes, there were things there. I'm not, I'm not suggesting at all that, that the, uh, the situations were, were fictitious or made up. They, they, they weren't, they weren't. Okay, there, there were those, but that is a drop in the bucket compared to all the positive that comes out of senior living. And I just wish that we would see equal numbers of positive um, national. Now, you, you will see, if you pick up the local newspaper, you'll see in the county news or the township newspaper, you'll see something that a local assisted living did, which was positive. Um, but for a national provider 
to to share a positive story about how great the industry is. That's where I'd like to see as well. Yeah, I, listen, I, I think negligence occurs in every industry, and I don't think any industry, especially in healthcare, with the volatility of our of the acuity of our patients, is immune to, God forbid, you know, having an issue or or an unfortunate incident. What I would also like to see for the press to do is, like you said, give the same amount of energy, the same amount of attention to all the positive things that are happening out there. You know, and I think there's such there are such good people with such great intentions in senior living. And I do agree with one thing of the article said is that, and you said it a very similar statement, we always have to look in the mirror. But that's where that transformative aspect of getting better daily. We're not perfect, and none of us will ever be, especially as an industry, especially when you're treating humans. But I think that one thing that is imperative above all is that the operators right now, based on that article, I think every operator and every investor has to look at the people that they are trusting to run their portfolios. And if they can't be trusted, then get another operator. I, you know, there are plenty of operators that are looking to manage communities. Don't get, don't pigeonhole yourself to just working with the same operator, especially if it's if, if they're not a good extension of your repu, of, of your reputation. So, you know, recently we saw a an example of that. Well, Well Tower teamed up with RUI Retirement Unlimited and purchased Brandywine a long-standing portfolio in the Northeast. And the positive of it is that a lot of the bad providers shut down. A lot of the bad operators are no longer around or will no longer be around. And then you're seeing, again, the advance and the catapult of the ones who are actually doing it the right way. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's the one thing we saw coming out of the pandemic. The questionable leaders, the questionable operators didn't survive the pandemic because when everything went down and everybody was getting together and sharing best practices and, and really doing what we could, um, the good operators banded together and, and we, we offered the help and we offered the support. Um, but the, the lackluster operators, I, I, didn't really make it out of there. And, and, and same thing with leaders, right? I mean, we were, we were in, a, a time where everywhere from community leadership to executive leadership had to roll up their sleeves and go into communities and work unending hours and days and weeks. And those that were not in it for the right reasons didn't make it out of it because they, when the going got tough, they said, I'm going to leave. And and those that are left standing were so much stronger for it because we've got the experience and, and we did it and we worked hand in hand and we gained the respect, not only of our residents, but the team members. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I was in communities, not in New Jersey, because during the pandemic, I wasn't working for an operator out of New Jersey. I was working for an operator outside of New Jersey. And I was in Florida and I was in the Carolinas and I was in Tennessee. And I was working with, with that maintenance staff. And I was working with those housekeepers. And I'm not special. I'm saying this is what the industry did. That's what we should be covering in these national periodicals. That's the success stories. That CEO, that C-level suite who was wearing jeans and a t-shirt side by side with their minimum wage caregiver working hand in hand. That's what I wish was, was being shared because that's what was really happening out there tenfold over the very, very sad stories that the Washington Post shared. But those were a drop in the bucket compared to all the positive that's been coming out of this industry for decades. Amen on that. And, and just again, one of the article highlights were a significant amount of elopements that happen in a specific uh, region of the country. So, in just to respond to that, then how does distinctive senior living prioritize safety and security in your senior living communities? Communication. Uh, all bad things are negated by communication. And that's, you know, our, empowering our team members if they see something, if they see that something isn't functioning properly, or if they see that a resident isn't atypical like they normally would, to report it and to talk about it. You know, we, we often say multiple heads are better than one. 
So communicate. I would rather get a phone call on a Sunday from a caregiver or a nurse in one of our communities so that we can talk about something and prevent it than to be talking about it on a Monday after the fact. So it's all about communication and realizing as an industry, as a company, any community, we're not perfect. But how we collaborate and how we communicate with each other is what prevents the, the negligent things from happening. I love how you grew up in the industry, Demi, because you're able to give such a genuine, raw answer to all of your responses because you've seen, you don't respond to anything in a, uh, you know, hypothetical. You lived it, and especially during a pandemic. So let's go back to, again, that, that servant mentality that se seems to be inherent with you. Tell me how you grew up personally. Siblings, where your fa your father or mother, tell me about that. Yeah, so only child. So I didn't have the benefit of having siblings. Um, now that I've got three kids of my own, I I've, I've had to learn what siblings are all about and the sibling rivalry and the older and the younger. And um, my, my, my daughter rules the house. She's the youngest, but she rules the house, as, as, as I know probably your house as well. Um, my my parents worked at, at, at the ground level. My, my dad was a, a maintenance and, and janitor in, in the local school system. And so, you know, I think learning the sweat equity and putting it into it was important. And when I got into senior living, I didn't know that I was going to be in senior living for, for my career. I mean, I literally thought it was a summer job coming out of high school. Uh, but I saw the long-term benefit. And, and that's thanks to having a lot of really good mentors in the industry. I mean, my, my first executive director gave me an opportunity. And then when I was a memory support director, I had an amazing executive director. She was hard on me. She would take my service plans and she would mark them up with a red pen. And at the time I was like, why is she being so mean to me? She wasn't being mean to me. She was forming who I am today. And, and I can only hope to do that in the future as well. You know, to, to if we just say, yeah, it's, you're, you're okay, Andre. Yeah, your, your work was okay. We're not really building you for future. We're building you for now. We're, we're letting you get by for another day, but are we grooming you for the next five, 10, 15 years of your career? And, and there's a respectful way to do that, but we have to, we have to have the difficult conversations. We've got to be respectful about it, but we've got to have the difficult conversations to say, this is where you're doing an amazing job. This is where I need you to step it up, but this is how I'm going to help you to get there. And I was fortunate enough to have that. And, and I can only hope to do that you know, in, in, in my role moving forward as well. Listen, it's, it's our job, not so much to lead the current teams, but to create the future leaders that will lead the future teams. Because I do think that, again, there, there'll come a point in time where we will hopefully leave senior living better than we entered it and make sure that the future generation also appreciates and protects that. So what makes Dan Wolin happy? Excellent question. Um, I, I like to know that my job has a purpose. And, and you said it a minute ago to leave senior living better than we found it. Um, if we don't do that, then we failed massively. And I want to continue to evolve with the industry and stay ahead of the curve and, and really leave that lasting footprint. Now, whether that's going to be at a national level across the country or whether that's just one individual. You know, if 25 years from now, there's a, who now is a current dishwasher or an activity assistant who's sitting in my position, I, I, I've been successful. I've, I've put that, um, that positive impression. And, and I think, you know, teaching my children the, the value of hard work, um, are they going to get into healthcare or senior living in particular? Probably not, but that they know that all rewards don't come easy and, and we gotta, we gotta work for it. We gotta work for for what we get. And the outcomes come through our hard work. It's not new to us. And if you could go back to that young Dan who was washing dishes with a ton of humility, what would you tell that Dan? Just be patient. Be patient. You know, in some ways it feels like the last 25 years have gone by in a blink. But in other ways, it's been a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And, and I'm no different than you are or anybody else in our industry. Um, just be patient and, and work every single day, wake up every morning, hoping to make today better than you did yesterday and do it the same the next day. And, um, the rewards come, the rewards come. And, and that's, that's our industry as well, right? If we're providing, if we have a good product, 
and we have good people and we have a good process, the profit comes in turn. If you look at the the statistics, Dan, and if you look at the trends, the best days of senior living are ahead of us. When you look at the fact that there are less construction, less development happening right now, and then you have the silver tsunami and, and the baby boomers, you know, basically in line to be our future resident, the demand is going to support the supply. And I think that we are in a very, very exciting time of senior living. And I think with someone like you at the helm, someone who understands the business, somebody who understands the humble beginning, somebody who understands the fact that the people who need to lead the future of senior living need to be able to manage their ambition, right? Manage their expectations and understand that you know, if we focus on value, if we co focus on partnerships, if we focus on just doing it right, and like you said, getting better daily, success is inevitable. But when we take shortcuts, when we are, you know, either blind in, in our ability to partner with someone or unfortunately negligent, that that's when the bad things occur. But I think you're, you're someone who has shown for a very long time that you do it right, that you align yourself with the right people. And as a result, I think the future and senior living with people like yourselves is in tremendous hands. Not only the prospect of senior living, but really the value in the fact that we're gonna learn from some of the things that we potentially could leave behind and really be excited about the future. And the fact of the matter is that we are going to really give baby boomers what baby boomers deserve, which is high quality living in senior living and hopefully, hopefully provide to them that generation what they have provided to us. It has been a pleasure to have you on the Bed Way podcast. It's been a pleasure to, to, to reconnect. And I am so happy and I'm so excited to see the growth of Distinctive Senior Living in 2024. And remember, we are changing the habits of yesterday by creating the new healthcare reality of tomorrow. Thanks so much, Dan. Appreciate you. Thank you.